Greetings, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sarah Charters. I'm the president of the United Church of Canada Foundation, and I am so glad uh, that you're able to join us today for this very important conversation that we're going to have here. Uh, before we get going, I would like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from uh, the east end of Toronto, which is the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, Waukee, uh, and part of the Williams Treaties from 1923. And um, as I say that, as I say a land acknowledgement, as I was reminded by uh, an elder uh, last falls in saying that I'm creating a relationship with the land uh, and with the caretakers of this land. And so I express my gratitude for everybody who's, uh, who's come before and has been stewarding this land. Uh, and I'm committed to, to learning about the treaties and about the changes that evoked and how this land has been used over time. And I'd invite you just to think about where you are and, and your relationship to the land, uh, where, where you are situated. Um, and I would very much like to welcome our moderator for this panel, the Reverend Dr. Jennifer Jansen Ball. Jennifer uh, resides in Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 territory, the homeland of the Métis. Uh, she serves as the Executive Minister of Theological Leadership and she's passionate about theological education that transforms and engages people, communities, uh, and in the crucial justice issues that face us all, particularly around climate change and ecological justice. So Jennifer, so pleased to have you as a colleague and uh, to have you as the moderator for this discussion. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. It's lovely to be here with everybody today. So thank you as well for joining us. It's my honor uh, and delight to be joined by two colleagues for whom I have very deep respect. The Reverend Dr. Haran Kim Craig, who is the 14th principal of Emmanuel College of Victoria University in the University of Toronto. She concurrently also holds the position of professor of preaching, and she is the first racialized person in both of these roles. Haran received the Distinguished Alumni Award from Emmanuel College in 2020, which is the highest honor granted to Emmanuel alumni. She is also a past Roundtree and McGeechee Senior Scholar. So welcome, Haran. I'm also joined by the Reverend Dr. Alan Lai, who's the current principal of the Center for Christian Studies. He has uh, many years of guiding the formation of ministry personnel with teaching both at Waterloo Lutheran Seminary and Vancouver School of Theology. And he was most recently in leadership at South Arm United Church in Richmond, British Columbia. He has a keen interest in interfaith dialogue and global citizenship, and he's also a foundation board member. So welcome to the two of you. Our uh, first question that we're going to engage with, and I'll, um, I'll say a little bit first and then invite uh, Haran to go first, followed by Alan for this first question. We wanted to acknowledge the uniqueness of this panel in terms of um, being the first. So Alan was also, is also the first racialized principal of the Center for Christian Studies. And I happen to be the first woman and first queer woman in the position that I currently hold. And so we wanted to have a bit of conversation about um, both the challenges and opportunities of being the first in our particular roles and what some of our reflections are on that. I think um, for me, I'll just briefly say, because I really wanted to have time to hear from Alan and Haran, that in some ways as the first one, you can, in my experience, set some of the expectations for the role because no one else has occupied it in quite the same way with your particular identity. So there's a bit of freedom in that, but I think also sometimes it can be hard to be taken uh, as seriously uh, in part because we may be doing things differently out of particular identities and commitments, um, as well as not being kind of the typical person that you might see in the role. So I wanted to invite first Haran and then Alan to reflect a bit on, on their experiences of being the first in their particular roles um, and, and what that has meant. Thank you so much, Jenny, for, for your kind introduction, and thank you, the Foundation, for hosting this uh, event. Um, yeah, so sharing my own experience about being the first, um, the most surprising thing that happened when the news of my appointment of uh, principalship at Emmanuel College became public is that I, 
received so many emails from people that I never met before. Their message to me was very consistent, was that their, their message was like, your very presence in this role matters to them and gave them hope, affirmation, and confidence. As Jennifer said, that it was not the first time I was the first. Um, the things that uh, Jennifer has mentioned, I was also the first racialized person to hold the professorship at St. Andrews College in the first 112 years of its history. Um, but, and when you kind of branch out uh, beyond uh, Canada, I believe that this was the Association of Theological Schools uh, was telling me that I will, I'm the first generation Korean woman to lead the theological school in the entire Association of Theological Schools that has about 300 member theological schools in both US and Canada. And I haven't researched yet, but I think I'm the only Korean who is elected as a president or principal in any Canadian universities and theological schools as well. So I have to say that I feel the weight on my shoulders of the hopes and expectation of the racialized people like me who also want to be recognized for their gifts and contribution. And at the same time, that the, the recognition of that and the cheering uh, for my leading is a real gift and an honor. So on one end, I know that people are rooting for me, whether I am uh, conscious of that or not, and, and that's an amazing um, support. And on the other hand, is a, is a real pressure uh, that I should not uh, fail or disappoint them. Um, so that that's sort of, I think I will share and I would uh, add on the layer of being also kind of coming from the Asian culture where um, they kind of model minority um, that we kind of internalize within ourselves um, and in society where the society is still very, you know, in, especially in Canada, I'm talking, um, still very white dominant and looking at different racialized group and certainly looking at Asian descent uh, leaders or the, you know, other, other students or those who are making waves um, have that pressure of model minority, which is another form of racism in some ways. And so, um, so navigating those, um, is is uh, a challenge. Thank you. And I share the same kind of mentality with Haran that, that it is an honor to be uh, able to to lead and given the chance um, to to shape the uh, another generation of uh, of leaders in the church. So it, it is an honor, and I share a lot of things that she said about the weight. I think. The idea of being the first is kind of interesting terminology because in, so when will be the who will be the second? Or are we paving the way for the second? So that the the, the, the weight comes in because we what we do and how we behave could potentially set up another stage for another round of new leaders or ethical minorities uh, um, to be uh, professors or, or or principals in the future. So it's that 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 is it is there. But I think of like when I was a student, um, it was more than thirty years ago. I came to Canada and study, and I a little bit of reflection of thirty years ago. It it was different. And many of you in the audience might might, might testify that you know the theological scene was was very different, and the kind of teaching books that we read, everything is heavily you know. You know, Anglo European, you know, type. So for us now in this position of leadership, it gives us a chance to shape and also to make our learning and the school diverse. It's not just the concept, it's a reality. And that is another layer of, of pressure and, and um, to help us to make our classrooms and workplace really uh, diverse and, and, and um, uh, yeah, diverse. And so, and I guess maybe not so much in the, well, I should say in the secular university, you know, scene, 
those folks are talking about EDI, which is equity, diversity, and inclusion. That is the commitment going into the future. And I do not know uh, how much in the theological sense that in also in our churches thinking the EDI mentality is the way that we should do. And I thinking that is the, the way to do it, but how can we do it that we have this opportunity to, uh, to model it and to give input to it. So it is exciting. So I like the idea of the first, I looking forward a time when there will be an, a second. <laughs> That's what <laughs> I want to say. Thank you both for sharing a little bit of your own experiences and the hopes and challenges in, in being the first and the um, particularly the weight that that carries, uh, which which is a blessing and a challenge in and of itself, of course. And um, so thankful that, that we can share uh, in this together as well, because being the first is often also a bit of a lonely and isolating kind of experience. So to be able to find colleagues uh, and know that there are those who are silently and, you know, allowed cheering, cheering you on and um, helping to carry some of that weight as well. I want to shift a little bit to thinking about uh, theological education as we continue to live into what some are saying are is a post-pandemic world, certainly a world that has been shaped uh, and reshaped by the COVID pandemic. And I'm wondering if you could share a little bit, and I'll start with Alan this time and then move to Haran. Um, some of your thoughts around what things have changed in theological education as a result. Uh, what are some of the challenges facing the task of theological education given um, the realities we, we now face? Well, the pandemic has shaped us in a different ways. And I think during the pandemics, lots of stuff are online and online courses is a thing. And then it is going forward to be more. And so you, we already see, you know, the certain degree, like the scaling down of in-person gatherings. And even though we have in-person, uh, in-person gatherings, we also offer an online kind of a hybrid. Now that that is a challenge. I, I know for myself that um, it, it is a thing in going to the future, but online learning, it has its own challenge in itself. Um, and it is, a, sometimes it, it creates a, a difficult situations when when the quality of education need to be on our mind, because um, there is something to be in the same room to be, to see one another and to feel one another, and when everything is going online and going to that direction, it creates not just the technological challenge but also pedagogically and also the quality of education where people what do they learn and how would they receive that kind of things that that to me is a a wonderful challenge i would say and we hope that we're able to uh, um, to address that and the other is the um the need to collaborate i would say um uh, for our theological schools gathering, you know, once a year, we, we already start collaborations because we feel like it is difficult to be uh, on your own. It is difficult to do things by ourselves. We need partners and we need to identify who can be our partners. And so I enjoy the, the collaborative spirit when we met, every time we meet, it's just a good, so it may be, you know, uh, my short time as principal, when I go to those meetings, it was very encouraging. And also the world uh, post pandemic, in one way is open up so many opportunities and also realities and how we encounter the world, how we need to understand the world and how much we are together makes it more obvious. So theological learning, I would say it, it is, it, it needs to go beyond just learning the Christian traditions. You need to understand other religions, other cultures, and other people. And that is a little bit of what I uh, what I see. Mm -hmm. um, so Hiran, here's you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Um, yes, exactly. That that's what I uh, also agree with you. That the kind of hybrid learning. I think that's the key word of twenty first century uh, theological education, especially post pandemic. Um, and so it's a reality, it's a necessity, but not without a problem. And I'm gonna kind of, uh, 
you know, agreeing with Alan's uh, sharing, um, I want to focus a little bit on mental mental health and mental illness. And this is something on the rise. And I have uh, witnessed and, and my colleagues as faculty and staff are clearly noticing among our student bodies, much more pronounced um, and uh, visible and invisible uh, illness in, is on the rise. Um, and therefore having a virtual learning um, has its own challenge. It's needed because um, it helps our students at a distance uh, who are beyond the greater Toronto area be able to still study and learn. Um, but screen uh, exposure is not good for their emotional, psychological, and mental health. Um, and so balancing that out um, in terms of the students' well-being, I think, is key to successful theological education. So that's that's one. Um, we all know COVID really exposed uh, various uh, forms of oppression and marginalization, and certainly economic, um, you know, financial crisis, housing. Um, those are not somewhere else. It's our students' very own lives. And so, like, for example, Emmanuel College has a food bank that goes to students, um, and that goes really fast. Um, and basic necessity like toothbrush, toothpaste are needed. Uh, it just uh, is something that I, as an alumni of Emmanuel College 30 years ago, didn't have. So it's a different challenges um, that we need to pay attention to, not as a uh, unrelated to theological education, but it's a core essential needs that have to be uh, supported for their successful um, academic studies. Um, the uh, But ironically, so that's a challenge and, and really difficulties that I think we have to navigate of how do we uh, provide both online and in-person learning and gathering in such a way that helps students to learn better. Um, but ironically, though, you know, in a good positive front, um, because of these challenges, I find Emmanuel College is doing well. Uh, in terms of our enrollment, uh, our school is growing. Um, and the reason so is, is partly to do with the anxiety and the mental health issues that, that our students for the, as a future leaders and, 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 and uh, doing the ministry um, with a wide community of faith um, is noticing. And that's why they are coming. Um, our MPS uh, program uh, really is growing and, and uh, what this program does in terms of learning outcomes is to make sure that they are equipping leaders as counselor, chaplains, psychospiritual therapists and beyond. And many of our MDiv graduates are coming back to get that degree. And many of our current MDiv students are doing both degrees of MDiv and, and MPS, um, and that is, is very telling in my view. Um, and uh, in our Toronto School of Theology uh, environment where there are six other uh, schools working together and you know, so-called they are catching up due to our success. And so, but on the other hand is a reality that I think the world uh, calls us to uh, pay attention to. So therefore, in terms of the PhD programs in this area is also growing. Many students are studying uh, to be the expertise in this area, future faculty appointments and uh, specialists in this area as well. And uh, as Alan mentioned, and I'm very appreciative of you mentioning, I think the other huge area of growth uh, for uh, robust theological education today, something that uh, Emmanuel College has studied about 15 years ago is having a multi-faith theological education. Um, roughly speaking, um, you know, our in our basic degree programs, we have a one-third Christian, one-third Buddhist, and one-third uh, Muslim students, and handful of Jewish students as well as other faiths like Sikh and Hindu, and and then people 
without real clear religious or spiritual affiliation, but still wanting to engage theological education. So as uh, so that's that's a that's an interesting uh, piece, and I think what what I've been most excited about, and and the very reason why I want to be at Emmanuel College at this time of my career and and at this moment is to witness um, and contribute to our students leaving out that vision of being rooted in their own traditions while also engaging and, and, and bridging and expanding the belief, beliefs and practices of other faith. And, and this can be a transformative and, you know, glimpse of those transformation is happening and I'm witnessing right there. And that is such an exciting, um, not easy, but exciting um, endeavor that I want to share. Thank you. And just to give a little bit of comment before we go to the next one, as a short one, I think it's exciting that what uh, what uh, Heron is, is talking about, the whole idea of like um, theological education as, at our, in our time needs to have a broader reconception of the content of what constitutes theological education. You know, it is going beyond learning like 2000 years of Christian theology or traditional history, not to suggest that they are not needed, not what I want to say. I'm saying because the world has changed around us and the, and the people we're going out to, to serve and do uh, engaging with different type of uh, talk, the, the substance of theological reasonings or, or practices or, or even courses need to embrace the changing world that include other religions, other cultures, and to not just like uh, repeat, I would say, like say what I learned 30 years ago, that would be not a, a good way. I think that is to add on to what uh, Heran to say about moving forward to reconceptualize uh, those courses with other cultures, other religions, other ways of thinking in the society in mind to re make a course exciting. Mm, thank you, yes. Thank you, both of you. Uh, I think we're leading into the next question, really. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I just wanted to note, I think both of you were sharing about in different ways, uh, the importance of engaging in embodied learning and uh, attending to the realities that students are facing, knowing that they're also the realities that the people that, that will be served are facing in terms of some of the socioeconomic and mental health challenges that you spoke about, Haran, but also in terms of the diversity of cultures, of perspectives, of ways of engaging in, in education and learning and integration, um, that those are really important factors in, in what theological education is about. So our, our so as I said, I think you're moving us into mm -hmm. the next question too about um, what do we see as directions that the United Church is going in? What are the kinds of leaders that we need? What kind of theological education um, uh, is needed or how can the schools contribute to, the, to that kind of direction? And I think you were speaking about that already in terms of um, continuing to learn and engage with other religions, with other cultural perspectives and worldviews and ways of doing mm -hmm. things, but would just invite you to share some more reflections on that. Mm -hmm. Good. Yes, may I start? Great. Um, yeah, so it's really building upon the previous com you know, comments and, and sharing. Um, you know, we might say that UCC membership might be dwindling and that's a reality. But as a nation, I think Canada's population is growing and hopefully continue to do so due to many, many factors. I think our indigenous people's populations are growing. That's exciting. But due to uh, also a surge of new immigrant, immigrants. And these immigrants carry multiple religious identities and bring their own cultural heritage good and bad, right? Like our own here too. Um, and those need to be honored, recognized, and even contested and challenged, right? You know, kind of reforming theological understanding here. Um, and so theological leadership today is not just to, to help our folks to be literate, right? 
uh, public intellectual and, and, and theologians, but also in our own tradition, which is Christianity, but in other faith really as well is a great asset for our church as United Church looking ahead for the second century. And we already know that UCC is a, a fruit and a gift of out of the ecumenism. And ecumenism basically means to work right together for common vision while recognizing different heritage, different traditions, different histories. Um, and that spirit of ecumenism could extend beyond Christianity. Um, and and uh, but that takes a very particular and um, robust, I think, leadership training of how to navigate those differences and how to have a difficult conversations that allow, you know, disagreement to be held without demonizing or labeling. It takes a real uh, nuanced, uh, mature. Uh, leadership skills um, to lead into the next step, right? In a world where um, black and white kind of a polarization, uh, you know, if you're right, I have to be wrong kind of binary um, understanding and practices are so much everywhere. Uh, and it's hard to listen to those who have different opinions and so on. And those opinions are shaped by not just the political, right, it related, but also religious and cultural uh, understanding. So I think we have a role to play in a big, big way. And I think whenever I'm in global church, whether it's a WCC or WCRC or other gatherings, I'm so proud of being United Church of Canada member because we have done some really incredibly bold and, and sustained mature uh, leadership to be able to hear those uh, otherwise uh, not heard and seen those who are otherwise overlooked um, and, and bring people together. And, and, and uh, so that's, that's something um, that I really want to highlight further along. Sure, I think the, um, the United Church, um, if we only hear that closing churches narrative, uh, we may be very disappointed, but that is not the only narrative. And I think think of the recent United Church directions, um, think of like what trying to re-engage in mission, you know, church planting, and also behind Jennifer's you know, screen, you see discipleship, uh, or no, that it doesn't see discipleship, you see those, those adjectives only. But discipleship is again on our agenda. So these aren't, um, traditionally reflected in our courses, you can tell. And also not traditionally, we like at the United Church, you know, our tradition might not be talking too much about it, but now it's now back on the agenda. This, it plays uh, a challenge on, 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 uh, for schools in what way we can, uh, because we, the, the church and, and, and the schools, they, we are partners, we need one another. And how well we can engage in actual like um, not to say the the the, uh, the in the natural you know the the parts of that are not important. Not that I'm saying that. I'm thinking for the the reasons reasons direction of the church. In what way theological school can participate in making sure that the mission part of it, the disp discipleship of it, and the maybe you know building a new congregation part of it. In what way we can equip people to do that and, and the, the importance of practice, the importance of able to build communities, able to uh, you know, gather people together and do community gathering. This is also important part of theological learning. And I hope our schools are able to start talking with our United Church you know, counterparts to talk about, hey, you are going to that direction in what way our courses or, uh, or even event or webinar can reflect that. Yes, very 
Uh, thank you both for that. Indeed, the schools and the church are partners in this. And I think that, as Alan uh, referred to earlier, that's been one of the gifts of the theological schools circle, which gathers together both the church and uh, the principals, presidents, keepers from our theological schools to have both these kinds of conversations, but also to identify some of the ways in which we can continue to collaborate together. Um, and, and I think that's bearing fruit in a few different ways. I know there's a course that's being developed to be shared mm -hmm. amongst a couple of the colleges. And uh, collectively, we're also in a place where we're um, hoping to seek some additional grant money to uh, further the collaborative work that we might be about together. And that is certainly something that the United Church is also uh, prioritizing in terms of what we see as ministry needs now and into the future, uh, looking particularly at different models of collaborative ministry, what's the kind of leadership that's needed, uh, both for ministry personnel and for lay leaders um, in those kinds of models and the important role that the schools have in, in helping to uh, shape that kind of conversation and, and that kind of training and formation. So much appreciated. I wonder if we shift now a little bit to uh, some of the pedagogical challenges that you might see going into the future. Um, you each spoke about that earlier when we talked about um, the changes in the post-pandemic world and some of what that's meant for theological education. But are there some things that you might want to reflect on around um, course design, integration of theological learning with other disciplines, uh, intercultural awareness, and the, the ways in which we learn differently based on our cultural background in part. Um, just some opportunities to reflect on, on that. Alan, maybe did you want to start this time? Okay. Uh, all right. Um, pedagogy. I think um, that that is a huge topic and how then we able to um, make sure that that we are engaged with the, the our students with with the world and and the and different ideas. I come from this point of view where thinking of like thirty years ago when I was a student, pretty much uh, I was pretty much a minority. Not many people like me in the classroom, and the way to teach is pretty much like lecture or the, you know that kind of things. I, I think if our classrooms are really diverse and if our classroom really, our, our courses and everything, wanting to invite people from diverse cultures, background, coming to study together, there's a need to have our professors and teachers able to exercise what I call culturally sensitive pedagogy. Um, it begins with the recognitions that uh, uh, because we come into the theological world, a lot of people come to this with a love for the Bible, theology, and and history. That the academic stuff. Some, not not. I'm I'm not saying everybody, but lots of people like that. And we come to this point when we become teachers, have gone through you know different level of academic excellence may or may not have, depends on where they get the training and how they will learn, may not be able to reflect significantly, significantly about the idea of culturally sensitive. Now that not everybody learns the same way and that cultural sensitivity is needed. It demand a spiritual attentiveness to others. It's not just a mental or cognitive idea, but I'm thinking more and more that if we are really interested to teach uh, people in a just way, we ourselves need to have a way to explore and to have chance to, to dive deeper into different cultures of learning and, and, and teaching. So I could, would I be too, too much to suggest maybe the foundation to give us a grant so that we can take a whole bunch of professors going overseas for 10, 10 days or you know, a month, you know, in, in intensive experiencing of cultural exchange in teaching and learning. And when they come back, they know what, how to, or what does it feel like to teach in, or teaching people from another culture or, or other language other than, than English, that kind of thing. Um, I, just, I should stop here. <laughs> <laughs> 
thank you so much for um that note. I had that in my uh, note as well in terms of the you know culture is such a such a topic <laughs> to unpack and and uh, you know I think it's a lifelong learning uh, and endeavor to understand because culture is not static, right? Um, and and it involves religion, but it's beyond religion as well. Um, but uh, the things that haven't been shared, um, I'll just name a couple. One is uh, use of technology and AI. I think this is going to be a challenge for the 21st century. Um, and um, very, very good in some ways, right? The fact that we are having this gathering over Zoom is, is, is a gift. Um, but uh, but technology again is is dangerous if it's misused and uh, so AI, um, you know, you might have heard of the you know now they are generating their own papers and and so on so so plagiarism around that um, mm -hmm. and how how do we detect that and and um, cultivate otherwise ethical one I think that would be a, a pedagogical challenge. Um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully we find a way, but I think it's certainly a very big uh, headache for our faculty to deal with those. Um, I'll mention about culturally sensitive pedagogy. I would um, mention um, also, you know, pronouns accessibility issue is a very, very important these days. And so, you know, students with a new neurodivergent um, attention uh, disordered and all kinds of um, cognitive, uh, intellectual uh, disability that people carry, um, and and uh, doesn't mean though they are they are therefore unable to study. So how do we make uh, those students' needs are met? I think is is important in our course uh, designing as well as delivering and so on assignments. I mean there are just so many layers um, that uh, we need to take into account. Um, but the uh, couple other things that I think I, I will share what uh, Emmanuel has been doing um, this past academic year ongoing until this August, uh, we've been engaged, we meaning entire body. So all faculty, all staff, and many teaching assistants who are uh, part of our PhD students are working on trauma-informed pedagogy. Um, and trauma-informed student services. And so this is something that um, we have noticed and, and we meaning both faculty and staff uh, who are helping our students um, because trauma is a part of lived experience for so many people due to colonialism, sexism, war, climate crisis, and, and various forms of, of violence that they had or are having. Um, and so, and, and their traumatic experience triggers in class because of the topic that we are dealing with. So, um, first of all, naming that, that there is such, and, and how, how to then de-escalate um, and not re-traumatizing through our theological education. <laughs> Uh, is is a huge topic, and mind you, you know those uh, traumatic experiences sometimes in conflict, right? So A student has A trauma, but B student has B trauma, and these two traumas are kind of cause and the impact of it, right? And so how do we then hold both together? So it's just a really, and uh, so and I would say that's an interdisciplinary approach we need, um, because in terms of um, our theological language. Um, you know, trauma might be not the word, although, you know, we could um, frame it, even the very own uh, season of Lent and, and uh, what does that mean that uh, Jesus went through the suffering and so on. I mean, we could frame that as trauma. So these are really uh, important, I find, uh, initiative that we have been um, having it and hopefully our students now graduate and into uh, ministry and other uh, work that uh, this particular pedagogy will uh, help them, their own trauma, but also help others who are traumatized. So that's one. And final one, this is my personal commitment and, and research interest is, is about how land actually teaches. 
how we tap into um, the very physical, material, environmental, natural world um, that we have to rely on, depend upon, and um, interact. Um, and so this is an ecological uh, conscious pedagogy, but I also name that as a very much what indigenous uh, folks were um, teaching us <laughs> and challenging us, right? Um, and, and so what does that look like? I think it, it really has to move, move beyond, um, you know, highly cognitive area, but more embodied, uh, holistic, um, and um, not human-centered, but, you know, what actually the, you know, the animals are teaching us, you know, just the kind of different way of knowing um, and discerning, praying, talking, um, and being being really engaging in that is is something I find uh, much needed and and um, and also toward healing and wholeness that uh, and I think COVID really helped um, us to see that a little bit but I don't think there are a lot more that we as a theological school and as a church um, can explore um, so. Thank you. Can I can I add just, mm, just yes, a little please. bit on that note that the part of that is to in our teaching and in the students' learning is to develop a global mindset um, and also the idea of intercultural uh, uh, reality. So how we do it or what courses to do it, what books to read, or what kind of activities we should design to enhance that we we are we we are trying to do ministry in the world. And that global mindset, or what I call global citizenship type of education, should be part of what the, uh, of theological education should be part of that. Thank you both for reflecting um, really on some of the pedagogical challenges and opportunities and the ways in which uh, theological education really needs to draw on um, the the current realities of our world around us on interdisciplinary um, understandings, uh, how we integrate that both into theological education and then uh, into leadership in the church. And it's certainly, again, an ongoing commitment of the United Church around becoming an anti-racist church and uh, continuing to work at decolonizing ourselves as well. And I think what you've shared uh, has touched on some of that, as well as the importance of um, diversifying the ways in which we teach to um, to be able to attend to the very real needs of students um, who come from different backgrounds, but also have different challenges um, around potentially being neurodivergent, um, the trauma-informed approach that you were each reflecting on, um, and just how important that is to, to our colleges and the church continuing to become um, an accessible place where all people truly do find a home. I wonder if you might want to share each of you one of the biggest lessons that you have learned so far from your experiences as principals. Um, um, well, I'll go. <laughs> um, I think uh, relationships are really important um you know the the things that i find uh challenging is there are demands right there are routine daily schedule of here and there going to what a b c d e um we but that becomes kind of mechanical right uh, but always um find most meaningful and grounding for me is that relationships matter, that uh, people actually care um, for what we are doing in terms of our mission and, and uh, the care for the congregations. And congregations are people within and, and, and even beyond people, right? Because people um, in their own journey, you know, uh, pets are important or you know, beyond the human-centered uh, world uh, are something that they are very much in relationship to. 
Um, and so that I think that's that's important. And and so I'm just looking at some uh, you know, wonderful chat um questions and comments. And so what's the theology behind that, right? What what is the theology? And I think our song of faith really clearly uh, name beautifully in my view that God is the one who desires relationships and seek such relationships. When we talk about justice uh, and justice from you know Hebrew um, uh, and and Christian uh, New Testament understanding is that kind of relational, just uh, right relationship and seeking that uh, because God seeks such relationship between God and us and between ourselves and with our neighbors. Uh, so that that seems to be very important. Um, and, and, uh, and also there are so many implications of such theology being confessed through our prayer, being expressed through our art and other ways of writing or you know, embodied experiences certainly through proclamation, um, pre of the resurrection and new life. Um, and all those are layer of whether you are in congregational ministry, uh, going through uh, people who are ill, who are going through the difficulties, as well as celebration, right, of the new life through baptism or new being new into joining the church um, and being also aging and, and going through different changes of life. And that kind of rite of passage, I think, ministers are such a privileged position to walk with and accompany those journeys um, and I think there are so much relevance of, of what um, this word is um, asking us to engage and, and, and God in that world um, is uh, also uh, with us, literally, um, and uh, that we are not alone in that. Yes, I think um, the first thing I think of is theology isn't dead as much as we're thinking that we are living in a secular society and multiple other religions, and we think, oh, theological schools or Christianity is going down. No, it's not. I think theology isn't dead. The well-being of our society and the world needs us, but it matters how we engage, how we connect with others, and how we make our contributions in the world of chaos and so many different you know, chaotic directions that theological schools can play a part Again, I don't think theology is dead or theological learning academically or practice-wise are still needed. They, we, it's not, not an either or question, but how we engage uh, in We are, we are uh, theologians in our schools and also in many other schools. We have a whole bunch of theologians, but not, not many who have, a, I increasingly think that, you know, that the, the principal should be having an MBA degree other than a PhD in, in theology. Now, partially joking, but still, principals look at the balance sheet and we just cannot sleep for, for many nights, I can tell you that. So money is needed. And for those of you who are donors supporting biological education, foundation, whatever, yes, your money is, is needed. That's all I can think of as my short time looking after a, a small school. Thank you both. Um, just in the last couple of minutes, I wonder if you might share with us uh, one of the things that uh, makes you most hopeful in your role. Um, well, I, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, no, 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 you, you first. No, 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 go ahead. 
I did it answer first before. <laughs> I'm always hopeful. I, I hope my personality is such that I, I, I believe that is the future for, for us, for theological schools. It just needs a creative, even radical the imaginations about our place in the world and how we, and, and the other things I, I did not talk about is we really need to collaborate. We need partners. I, like I said before, we cannot do this on our own and by ourselves. Currently, our models may, I don't know, may, may, may face a challenge, but I'm hopeful that we, for the love of God, for the love of our churches, people, and people who might not be Christians at all, our love for the world, and like God's love the world, will, will energize us to think that, yes, we have something positive to contribute. And I believed that the, the current direction of the church, which focusing on anti-racism, um, you know, building new congregations and all those things are encouraging. Um, well, I, I think that um, our, uh, you know, current student bodies are um, exciting. Um, you know, they are very much um, interested in so many things that I think um, that we need to wrestle with and, and uh, provide some uh, guidance and support. And so in some ways, you know, the beauty of adult education, right, is that um, those who are coming to our graduate schools are already have some motivation, right? To learn and do something, you know, we call in, in, in our own languages vocation and, and call. Um, and to see that uh, despite the challenges that I think our church and certainly um, mainline, um, you know, streams of our church uh, in North America is, is, a, is a challenge and yet, Knowing that challenge, what lies ahead, I think they see their role in it um, rather than, you know, avoiding it. And, and I think that is uh, amazing courage um, and the kind of igniting hope there is uh, certainly very uh, wonderful to be a part of. Um, the uh, theological education, at least in from uh, Association of Theological Schools, um, is, it is having a similar path um, that um, so dwindling uh, church numbers and um, you know lesser uh, numbers coming through MDiv is 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 across the board um, and uh, other professional degrees are growing is also a a, a trend um, and uh, but that doesn't mean right it doesn't mean that uh, the role of our um, traditional or existing uh, theological education model is not relevant. Um, but the other challenges that are named today, uh, technologies, one, uh, COVID pandemic uh, is something that we didn't know coming. Um, and the impact is still unfolding. Um, and, and so this is where, um, I think our own spiritual theological grounding um, and, uh, you know, even very scripture, I mean, that's the first five books of uh, Hebrew Bible, you know, talking about illness and, and uh, kind of, you know, issues are very much part of uh, their uh, faith formation. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, the kind of well-being, you know, in a big uh, language, uh, theologically, scripturally, uh, reflecting it and and what does that mean to be um redeeming and 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 uh, healing uh which Jesus ministry is key um work um and not just for the illness sake but for the whole community right not just individual uh salvation and and, and life giving life saving uh experiences um but also for the the communities that they are part of um and certainly with the climate crisis issue that is not just about our human community. Um, so those are, I think, uh, you know, really puzzling. Um, and, and so to me, the importance of theological education is ever more needed to, to grapple with those complexities um, and, and providing um, humbly 
but uh, with assurance of, of the robust theological inquiry, um, you know, deep engaged interpretation of the scripture, um, how our theology being continued to be relevant and resonating um, with the, the issues that are beyond um, the domain of religion, right? Thank you both again for taking the time to uh, be here to share your experiences of being the first um, and for your deep commitment to ongoing, engaging, um, diverse and relevant theological education. You've both spoken so passionately and so well about the ways in which that is happening and the ways in which the, um, you are helping to shape um, theological education within the church for the sake of the world. And so I very much appreciate uh, being able to have this time with you. And so thank you once again. Greetings, everyone.